The Second Punic War lasted 17 years. At the beginning of the war, fortune smiled on the Carthaginians. The magnificent Punic winning streak ended with a disastrous debacle of the Roman army at Cannae. Many Roman allies turned away from them. The king of Macedonia, Philip, fulfilling his deal with Carthage, attacked the Romans. Sicily and Sardinia, which Romans had recently conquered, revolted against their rule. The fate of the Roman Republic hung in the balance. Rome had to mobilize all its forces to change the course of this war. Every year, Roman and Carthaginian armies met on the battlefields in Italy, Spain, and the Mediterranean islands, but the count of victories started to lean in Rome's favor. Hannibal committed to breaking as many Roman alliances as possible, to make it impossible for Rome to continue the war. But this also restrained his actions. Hannibal's army had to rush between new allies to protect them from Roman attacks. Reinforcements from Carthage also did not come to Hannibal's aid. When deciding where to send troops, the Carthaginian oligarchy was practical. Hannibal's army in Italy was not a priority. For Carthaginians, keeping existing income sources and conquering new ones was more important. That's why the troops went to Spain to protect silver mines, to Sardinia to regain control over the island, and to Sicily to help rebellious Syracuse, but not to Hannibal's aid. Only nine years after the Battle of Cannae, Hannibal's brother Hasdrubal gathered an army and led it to Italy. Romans met his army near the Metaurus River in northern Italy. In the battle that followed, Carthaginian armies suffered a crushing defeat, and Hasdrubal himself fell in this battle. It was the first truly significant Roman victory over Carthaginians on Italian soil. Carthaginian casualties were so high that Romans called this battle revenge for Cannae. In this bloody stand, lasting for many years, Rome was prevailing. Spain was conquered. Sardinia and Corsica were taken back from the Carthaginians. Roman forces slowly pushed Hannibal's army back in the south of Italy. Roman envoys talked the Aetolian Union of Greek cities into declaring war on Macedonia. This forced Macedonian King Philip to stop the war against Rome. On Sicily, Roman forces, after a lengthy siege, took Syracuse. There was a single man behind many of these victories. Many years ago, at the hour of shame and despair of the Romans on the field of Cannae, there was a young military tribune named Publius from the family Cornelia nicknamed Scipio. He grew up on this war, and when his time came, after his father and brother fell in Spain, he took command of the Roman forces. In 205 BC, already as a consul, Scipio was in Sicily. He planned to bring the war to Carthaginian soil to force Hannibal to return to Africa to protect the capital. But Scipio did not have enough troops, because the Senate didn't approve this expedition. But he was allowed to recruit new forces and to use the legions he already had under his command. These legions consisted of the survivors of the Battle of Cannae. They were sent to Sicily as a punishment. These legionaries were eager to restore their good name and avenge their defeat. Scipio spent a lot of time training them. He introduced a new system of signals for more efficient control of the troops on the battlefield. He needed more cavalry, but he hoped to bring Numidians to his side once in Africa. A few years ago, Scipio made an alliance treaty with the Numidian king Syphax and befriended Masinissa, the Numidian prince. But the Carthaginians married Hannibal's niece Sophonisba to Syphax, even though she had been engaged with Masinissa. This broke the alliance between Syphax and Rome, but also turned Masinissa away from Carthage. But anyway, most Numidian forces obeyed Syphax, and Masinissa had only a small group of supporters and Syphax's enemies. At the same time, Hannibal's brother Mago landed in Liguria, in the north of Italy and he planned to hire mercenaries from the local tribes and go to Hannibal's aid. Besides this, Carthage resumed negotiations with Macedonian King Philip to persuade him to resume fighting against Rome. Once again, the situation started to look dire for Rome. But even in such unfavorable circumstances, Scipio decided to bring the war to Carthaginian soil. In 204 BC, 
Roman fleet sailed from Lilibeum and landed on the African coast. Right after landing, Romans besieged Utica, the ancient Carthaginian capital. Scipio did not have a lot of troops, just around 20 or 30,000. This army would not have been capable of besieging Carthage itself. The city of Carthage back then was larger than Rome, and three lines of massive defensive walls protected it. That's why Scipio decided to devastate the Carthaginian mainland and hoped for luck in a decisive battle. He also waited for support from Massinissa. Panic gripped Carthage. They relied on mercenaries and allied troops and didn't have a regular army. But almost all mercenaries were in Italy with Mago and Hannibal. Allied troops had yet to be gathered. But luckily for the Carthaginians, Scipio was not able to take Utica quickly. While Scipio was busy with the siege, Carthaginian gathered an allied army twice as big as the Roman one. Scipio had no other choice but to leave the siege and retreat. From the position of strength, Carthaginians offered peace talks and Scipio agreed to gain some time. He was waiting for Massinissa, who was gathering troops all over Numidia. Believing that there would be a peace treaty soon, Punic troops relaxed and lost concentration. Roman scouts came close to their camps and set them on fire at night. At the same time, Roman legions marched on them. Panic gripped Punic soldiers and they started to run for their lives. Romans were able to disperse the enemy army. Hasdrubal fled the battlefield and the Romans captured Syphax. After this, the Roman cavalry commander Gaius Lelius helped Massinissa to take control over Numidia. The majority of the Numidian riders sided with the Romans after this. After the defeat, the Carthaginian Senate asked for peace again, and Scipio agreed to a truce. Carthaginian envoys went to Rome, so the Roman Senate would approve the peace treaty. But the real task was to prolong negotiations for as long as possible. At the same time, when they left Carthage, messages were sent to Mago and Hannibal, asking the generals to return to Carthage. But unfortunately for Carthage, the Romans defeated Mago's army in the Battle of Insubria and mortally injured Mago himself. Together with the remnants of his army, Mago sailed to Africa, but he died from his wounds before his fleet reached Carthage. Hannibal also sailed back home, but he lacked ships to take all his troops with him. That's why Hannibal took with himself only his battle-hardened veterans, who were with him from the very beginning of the war. His cavalry and most allied troops were left behind at the Romans' mercy. When Magath and Hannibal's forces arrived in Africa, the Carthaginians broke the truce. They attacked the Roman fleet, sunk Roman ships, and killed Roman envoys. Hannibal was gathering forces and preparing the army for the decisive battle. Scipio realized that the situation was not favorable for him anymore and tried to avoid confrontation with Hannibal. He led his army to unite with Massinissa's forces, but Hannibal followed him. The Punic general knew how dangerous Numidian cavalry was and wanted to beat Scipio and Massinissa separately, and he almost succeeded. He intercepted Scipio's army on the field near the small town of Zama. Opposing armies pitched camps in front of each other. Hannibal sent scouts to gather intel about the Roman army. The Roman patrols caught some of them. Instead of executing the scouts, Scipio ordered them to be taken around the entire camp and released. Scipio knew that Massinissa's army was already approaching, but he was not yet in the camp. Massinissa arrived soon after Scipio had released the scouts. Because of this, Hannibal had misleading information about the size and composition of the Roman army. Hannibal still hoped to make peace with Rome and offered Scipio to meet, but they couldn't find common ground. Hannibal rejected the former peace agreement and put forward new, unacceptable conditions for Rome. Besides, now that his opponent was Hannibal himself, Scipio was not eager for peace. He wanted to be remembered as someone who defeated glorious Hannibal, not as a consul who signed a peace treaty with Carthage. The battle was inevitable. The battleground was a flat plain convenient for equestrian skirmishes. But unlike in his previous battles, Hannibal had less cavalry than his opponent. Scipio's army consisted of two reinforced Roman legions and two allied legions. He had a standard consular army, that is. Together with the troops brought by Massinissa, 
he had about 29,000 infantrymen. The cavalry consisted of 2,000 Roman equites, led by Gaius Lelius, and 4,000 Numidian riders, led by Masinissa. Thus, the total strength of the Roman army in the Battle of Zama was around 35,000 soldiers. Hannibal's army consisted of Magus mercenaries, Carthage city militia, Macedonian hoplites, veterans and allies Hannibal's brought from Italy. The cavalry consisted of Numidians from clans that were at war with Massinissa. Hannibal also had 80 war elephants. The total number of his army reached 40,000 soldiers. Scipio lined up his army in three lines. In the first line, there were inexperienced soldiers, or the Hastati. In the second line, Principes. And in the third line, the veterans, Triari. However, unlike the standard arrangement of maniples in a staggered order, Scipio placed them one after the other, leaving wide spaces between them, in front of the infantry, and in the gaps between the maniples, he put Velitas, lightly armored warriors, armed with javelins. On the flanks, he placed cavalry, on the left, Roman equites, and on the right, the Numidian riders. Hannibal also lined up his infantry in three lines. In the first, he placed all the Magus mercenaries, Ligurians, Gauls, Balearians, and Mauritanians. In the second line, he put the Carthaginian militia and Macedonians. In the third line, he put his battle-hardened veterans. On the flanks, Numidian cavalry. He also placed war elephants in front of the infantry formation. Roman and Punic armies were almost equal in numbers, but had many significant differences. The Roman army was well-trained and easily controlled, thanks to a newly adopted system of signals and commands. Hannibal's army consisted of warriors from different tribes and regions. Orders were given in different languages, and soldiers from neighboring units could not understand each other. The Romans had advantage in cavalry, but Hannibal had 80 war elephants. These were young animals, not fully trained yet. Hannibal did not know his army well, since most of it had not fought before under his command. He did not know most of his unit's capabilities, strengths and weaknesses, and could only trust his veterans. He had concerns about the combat readiness of Magus mercenaries, so he decided to put them on the front line, so they would have no chance to flee from the battlefield. In the second line, he placed the city militiamen from Carthage, whose fighting ability was also questionable, accompanied by battle-hardened Macedonian hoplites. In the third line, he put the soldiers he brought from Italy. The main idea of Scipio's battle plan was neutralizing the main advantage of the Carthaginians, war elephants. He hoped that he would be able to either frighten the animals or let them run through the Roman formation between the maniples. At the same time, Gaius Lelius and Massinissa had to drive over the Carthaginian cavalry. The fate of the battle was to be decided by a vigorous onslaught of well-trained infantry. Hannibal planned to hit the first line of the Romans with war elephants. The attack of the giant animals was supposed to disorganize Roman formation. Then the soldiers of the first and then the second line of the Carthaginian infantry were to hit the Romans. The veterans from the third line were to deliver the final blow and rout the Roman army. The task of the cavalry was to distract the Roman cavalry and to prevent it from helping the infantry. However, the battle did not go according to the plan of the Carthaginian general. War elephants were the first to enter the battle. As Hannibal had planned, they sped to the Roman formation. Scipio had experience dealing with war elephants before and knew their weaknesses. When the elephants approached, the Roman army began to shout, beat swords on shields and play trumpets and horns. The noise was so intense that some of the elephants got frightened, turned around and ran backward, not listening to the riders. The fate Hannibal prepared for the Romans befell his own troops. The elephants, frantic with fear, wreaked havoc on the first line of the Carthaginian infantry. Mauritanian mercenaries and Numidians who were on the left flank suffered the most. But not all war elephants were frightened by the noise. Most of the riders managed to keep control over the animals. When the elephants came at a close range, they were met with a rain of pilums and arrows. And again, some of the animals could not stand it and turned back to the right flank, where they broke the formation of the Punic cavalry. At this very moment, Massinissa and Gaius Lelius attacked the enemy cavalry. Only half of the war elephants reached the Roman infantry. When they were ready to strike, the Roman soldiers suddenly withdrew into the gaps between the maniples and then to the sides, 
clearing the way for the elephants. The elephants ran through these passages, almost without harming the Roman army. Spears and javelins flew at them from all sides. Frantic from pain and fear, the animals quickly became uncontrollable, passed through the Roman army and ran away. Meanwhile, the Roman cavalry closed the distance between themselves and the enemy. Carthaginian cavalry formation was disrupted by retreating elephants, and they were outnumbered, so the Romans managed to push them away from the infantry. Now, the main forces of both armies entered the battle. The first line of the Carthaginians hit the Roman Hastati, but the Gauls, Ligurians, Balearians and Mauritanians were not used to long, exhausting battles in tight formations. They excelled in individual duels or quick and fierce but not prolonged attacks. Therefore, their first onslaught was ferocious, but it quickly lost momentum, crashing against the Roman wall of shields, and the fighting spirit of the mercenaries began to fall. In the first clash, the Hastati not only endured the pressure of the Carthaginian army, but also managed to start pushing the mercenaries back. However, the first line of the Hannibal's infantry did not run. They had nowhere to run, as the Macedonian hoplites and Carthaginian militiamen were pressing on them from behind. The fight was incredibly fierce and bloody, and the battlefield was quickly getting covered with the bodies of fallen soldiers. The Hastati withstood the first onslaught of the enemy, but suffered severe losses, and their formation was messed up. The maniples began to crumble. The Carthaginian mercenaries from the first line also suffered significant losses, and were looking for ways to retreat. They tried to go through the second line, and in some places, fights between the retreating mercenaries and the advancing second line broke out. There was a break in the battle, which both generals used to restore order and formation of their troops. Scipio signaled the army to make several maneuvers, which they practiced back in Sicily. Having received clear instructions, the soldiers reorganized and restored order, the injured went back to the rear, and the fresh soldiers stepped forward. The principes shifted to one side, the triarii to the other. All these complex maneuvers were carried out very quickly. Hannibal also used the poles to overcome panic among the mercenaries and restore order in the army. He, like the Romans, stretched his army in a single line. He moved the remnants of the first line to the left flank and led his veterans to the right. Once again, the two armies faced each other, but the formation was linear and reserves were almost non-existent. The armies came together again, and the battle resumed. On the one hand, the Romans were more motivated and better trained. On the other hand, the Carthaginian army was not going to retreat. Most Carthaginian soldiers had nowhere to flee. They were in a foreign and familiar land. The battle lasted for several hours, and neither side could gain an advantage. At this time, while the battle between the infantry continued, the battle between the Roman and Carthaginian cavalry finally ended. The more experienced equites of Gaius Lelius and the more numerous riders of Masinissa first pushed back and then routed Hannibal's cavalry. At first, they chased the fleeing enemies. Then, for a long time, Gaius Lelius and Masinissa gathered the troops, tired from the chase and battle. At last, they were ready to return to battle. Roman equites and Median riders struck the rear of the Carthaginian infantry. Scipio repeated the maneuver that brought victory to Hannibal at Cannae a cavalry strike in the enemy rear, the encirclement of the enemy army, and its subsequent elimination. The soldiers of the Punic army, caught between the two fires, held on for some time, but panic and chaos played their part. The Carthaginians began to throw down their weapons and flee. Only Hannibal's veterans stood to the end, and all fell on the battlefield. Those who ran were chased and killed. Others were captured and enslaved. Hannibal, with several riders managed to escape from the battlefield at the last moment. The massacre continued until the evening. At least 20,000 of Hannibal's soldiers died, and the same number were captured. The losses of the Romans reached 5,000. Hannibal lost, Carthage lost, Rome and Scipio won. After this battle, resistance was useless. Carthage hastened to make peace with Rome on much worse terms than Zeus previously negotiated. After 17 years of fierce fighting, the Second Punic War ended with Rome's victory. But Carthage did not fall and was not destroyed. The Carthaginians still hoped that despite the heavy defeat, Carthage would still rise and dominate the Mediterranean.